This was the bloodiest commercial for cornflakes I've ever seen. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to the Post Geek Out Reaction. I'm Aaron. And I'm Michelle. And today we're talking about Logan. Now for anybody who has not seen one of these Post Geek Out Reactions before, this is not a review. I will be doing a review of this, it will be going up later this weekend. But the Post Geek Out Reaction is just our open honest thoughts about the thing that we just saw and that does include full spoilers. So if you have not seen Logan yet and you don't want to be spoiled, Tune out now, come back later for the official review. Mm -hmm. Also, I just want to apologize for two things. One, it's because if you've watched these before, you know we just do them whenever we have the time. And also, we can't control the heat in this building. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear a little bit of a hissing in the background. We have no control over that, and this is the only time that we had to actually record this, so yes. I apologize for that. And the other thing that I want to apologize for is that I am in no way wearing an appropriate shirt for this review. Neither am I. I just grabbed the first <laughs> random thing that was in the wash. The Switch came out today. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to grab some Nintendo stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, we also have to record this. Uh, mm -hmm. Screw it. Um, yeah, it's funny how Logan comes out on like the same day as the Twitch does. <laughs> the Twitch? The Switch. There we go. What a Switch. All right. Yes. So... <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna even gonna try and hide this from you guys. If you've been watching this channel, you know that for the last two weeks, I've been watching all the films that were nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars this year. The only one that I didn't see was Lion, and in all fairness, that's the one everybody said was the saddest. But I saw all the other eight films that were nominated for Best Picture. I cried more at Logan than I did at all of those combined. I'm not kidding you. At the end of this film, I was a blubbering mess. And as we were walking out of the theater, and I started describing the thing at the end that made me so sad, I started crying again just right there on the street. And if it weren't for the fact that we didn't get home until 2 a.m., I gladly would have recorded this last night, simply because I know the sight of a grown man breaking down into <laughs> tears over a Wolverine movie would get massive hits on the internet. Well, so, I'm sure if you think about that scene again during this review, you'll start crying. I'll just turn away and like pluck a nose hair and like, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, the story of this film is that it's in 2029, which isn't even that far into the future. I love that everybody was like, oh, it's a post-apocalyptic future, just like an old man Logan. That's the first thing I gotta say right now. Everybody stop freaking saying this film is based on old man Logan. I'm, listen, when I saw the original trailer, I was like, okay, well, they're taking inspiration from old man Logan, but you know, old man Logan starred the Hulk, Hawkeye, Red Skull, Doctor Doom, and Venom, none of whom are characters that they own. Like, literally all the characters that Fox owns, in the story of Old Man Logan, it goes, yeah, Wolverine killed all of them. Uh, spoiler for Old Man Logan. My bad. Uh, but yeah, it basically goes like, yeah, of course none of the X-Men are in here, there's a reason for that. So, uh, yeah. Everybody just stopped saying that this is based on Old Man Logan because I was like, well, they're going to find something to like tie it into Old Man Logan. This has nothing to do with Old Man <laughs> Logan other than the fact that Logan is an old man. That is it. There is no other connection to Old Man Logan at all. Except Logan is an old man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> old That's man it. Logan. That and they also drive across country. That yeah. is it. That is the <laughs> only connection. So everybody stop that. So, it's 2029, all the mutants are dead. There's like, you could count them on one hand, which, over the past like two decades, Marvel has done numerous events where the mutants just almost get completely wiped out, so I was like, that's a little bit of a nod to that. That's kind of cool that they did that. Um, although, I will say, when it gets revealed why the mutants have all died off in this one, it is so much better than what they have done in the comics. <laughs> uh, we will get to that in a moment. All right, so it's in the future, and Logan now just has a job driving a limo back and forth between Texas, or no, I think it's New Mexico. Well, at least that's where it's filmed. Yeah. But he has the job basically just driving a limo back and forth between the United States and Mexico. That's it. And he just has a crap life. Like, he, his life now doesn't resemble at all what his life back as the Wolverine was. Because, yeah, he's just wearing like a beat up old suit, he's getting drunk at night, uh, well, that part's still the same from back when he was Wolverine. <laughs> um, but, and he's just driving, like, rich businessmen, kids on their prom night. Like, that's it. And, like, that's what has become of this guy. And then one day, this lady shows up, and she says that she needs his help. She needs the help of the Wolverine. He's like, fuck you, I don't do that anymore. 
Which, by the way, this thing is rated R, and I knew that it was going to have lots of violence in there, but it's like, they let, they let you know right away this is an R-rated film, because, like, the first, like, 50% of dialogue for the first act of this film is just fuck. That's it. <laughs> just fuck, 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 fuck you, fuck that, motherfucker, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, I'm glad I've decided to not bleep these anymore. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so... This lady shows up, says that she needs his help. She's got this kid, says that it's her daughter. She's going to give him the rest of the money that he needs to buy this boat that he is going to just ride off into the sunset with. And so he's like, all right, fine. One last job. And for anybody who has ever seen a movie before, you know, it's that last job that always gets you. Uh, so he goes and he speaks with Charles Xavier, who he has been keeping in like this bunker out in the Mexican desert. And he's been watching over him with Caliban. Caliban, you might remember from the X-Men Apocalypse film. And he was the guy in there who's, like, helped people find mutants. And, like, he was working with Psylocke. Like, he was, like, a bounty hunter kind of guy. At least I think. I don't remember a lot from Age of Apocalypse. It was such a forgettable film. <laughs> and I got so much crap in the comments from people going, Well, clearly you don't understand the X-Men. Like, I do understand the X-Men, I also understand film, and that was a very meh film. Uh, I'm sorry for anybody out there who thinks that I didn't think they perfectly captured the X-Men when they had the flying dude die in a plane crash. And for anybody out there who's going to go, well he actually did die in a plane crash. Yeah, after he has wings ripped off, because he couldn't, yeah, it's a whole thing. Anywho, <laughs> I'm not getting into an argument with the comments on this one. Anywho, so... He then goes to Charles Xavier, and Charles Xavier, man, you remember Professor X from the previous films? Mm -hmm. Where he was noble and elegant, and he always had the right thing to say, and Patrick Stewart was just always this bastion of morality. In this one, he is an old man who doesn't want to take his pills. And for anybody who has ever had a grandparent or a parent who has been in that situation, who they're just, you know, like... They're just kind of like mumbling with dementia, mm -hmm. and they're just cranky in their old age, and they just, again, like I said, the best way I can describe it is he's a guy who doesn't want to take his pill. Like, Logan forces him to take pills, and he's like, show it. He's like, that. Like, <laughs> I've had grandparents do that when my dad was like, take your pills. You need to take your pills. And it's like, yeah, it's like getting a kid to do it. And it's like, Patrick Stewart nailed that <laughs> performance. Like, he perfectly captured this. I'm going to talk in a little bit about how good Hugh Jackman is in, in this. Patrick Stewart just had that perfect level of subtlety to his performance of like, you know, he wasn't going over the top with it. He sounded exactly like everybody's grandparents sound, sound, sound. Everybody's grandparents sound. I can't say sound. I can't sound out sound. Everybody's grandparents sound when they get to that age. Uh, and yeah, for all of us out there, like, it's sad when you see that happen to your grandparents. Mm -hmm. And for the audience who watched Patrick Stewart back when he was Professor X, it's sad for us. It yeah. is kind of like seeing a grandparent go through this. Mm -hmm. Like, man, that's crazy that they were able to do that. Uh, but there are these guys called the Reavers, and they're after the little girl, and they actually kill the mother, and now Wolverine is stuck with this little girl. Turns out that little girl is kind of his kid. They took a sample of his DNA and the DNA of many other mutants, and they've been basically just cloning these kids. And, well, not cloning as in, like, the sci-fi, like, we put you in a tube and now you've grown into full foreign person. That comes later. <laughs> no, it's more of, like, the realistic cloning, where it's like they take the uh, egg and are able to impregnate someone with it. Uh, so, yeah, she's not, like, a total replica of Wolverine. She just has the same powers as him. And basically it then, at that point, just becomes a long cross-country road trip as they have to get to a destination where they say it's a safe haven for mutants. Uh, that's the basic premise. And now we're just going to get into our general discussion about, uh, I gotta say, we already talked about Patrick Stewart and how, like, I thought it was great that they kind of captured that feeling of just watching someone that you know and love at an older age just kind of deteriorating mm -hmm. because, yeah, if a regular person gets dementia, it's sad. If the most powerful telepath on the planet gets dementia, it's destructive. Yes. Like, there's a moment, like, I saw in the trailer a moment where Wolverine was, like, crawling towards someone and you just saw, like, the back of their head in there. I was like, that's going to be, like, old-ass Magneto. I know it's going to happen. They're going to bring, like, 
And old Magneto in here, he's almost like in a coma. Like they're gonna have him like he can barely move and he's just hooked up to machines and he's just keeping Wolverine where the magnetism. That's what they're gonna do. No, that's Professor X having a seizure. That is him like locking up and he is just shutting down everyone around him and Wolverine has to get to him to give him his medicine. Like that's horrifying to see that happening. And I mean, I was listening to reviews out there that said like, oh yeah, this film makes you understand why mutants, you know, maybe you shouldn't have mutants around. I ain't going that far. <laughs> but it does make you realize, holy cow, that is how destructive their powers can be. Um, and it makes you realize, wow, no wonder so many people are afraid of it, mutants. Yeah, it, which that's a great thing that they did in here. Because uh, there is a moment where they meet this family out on the road and Charles basically just forces Logan to go and sleep at their place when they offer to give them like food and uh, shelter for the night. And Charles Xavier is like, oh, that would be lovely. Yes, we're on a road trip with my son and granddaughter. And Logan is like, all right, fine, old man. All right, we'll do this. Yeah, we're going to go and eat your place. And it's a very touching moment, like watching them bond. Like that's really yeah. the first time that you actually see like Laura actually smile mm -hmm. uh, in this. But then I love that towards the end, uh, I will talk more about the scene later, but I'll just get to the end now. Uh, towards the end of it, after they learn that they're a mutant, they tur he turns on them! Like, the, the dad of that family, like, after the dad comes in, saves Wolverine's life, he gets out of the car with his shotgun, and he realizes Wolverine's a mutant, points the gun at him, and tries to fire at him. And I'm like, holy cow! Yeah, it just does show you the discrimination uh, and the prejudices against mutants in a far more realistic way. Because it's not like, you know, people out there with giant sentinel robots going, yes, we will destroy all the mutants because <laughs> they're a threat to us. It is like regular people like, hi, my name's Joe. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, let's talk about, oh, this is all stuff going on in my life. What's going on in your life? Oh, we're bonding here. We're having a good time. You're a mutant? Go fuck yourself. Like, that is like, yeah, that's a lot of what, like, real life prejudices are. It's people who you would not expect to be prejudiced. Oh, yeah, they, have, they are fearing you now. Uh, so... I think they captured that perfectly. Uh, that whole scene with yeah. the family, though, I love that. Oh, uh, that that just made me really sad. It's like there came that moment, like when it showed, like outside the house, and you saw like cars driving around. And I was like, oh god, that family's gonna die. Like, yeah. It, no, but no, it was like a different set of people. But then it was the. Um... No, that was the same family. Uh, remember, they find this family on the side of the road with these horses. Yes, I know that. Yeah. Okay. And. Yeah. But like the. Uh... Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you... I'm sorry. When you, There's a scene in which you see all these cars driving around, and I thought it was the Reavers coming yeah, out. Yeah, so did yeah. I, but it turned out... It turns out it's... No, it's just these people who have been, like, tampering, who took control of their land, and every now and again they just shut off the water to their property. Uh, I don't even know if there's a reason other than just to fuck with them. Uh, but it, that's one of the great things. They set it up. They set it freaking up in this film. At the end of the film in which they reveal, again, we're getting into full-on spoiler territory here, at the end of the film, in which they reveal that this big, huge corporation is the one that killed off the mutants because they were so worried about them, the way they killed them off is that basically they discovered the cure for the mutant gene, and they just put it in the water supply, they put it in the food supply, so basically, they've been poisoning mutants for a decade now, and that's what killed them off. And that was, man, did not see that coming. But then when you stop and you look back at it, there's a whole scene in which they stop, they meet this family out there, and the dad is like, yeah, well, what are they doing out here with all these crops? And he's like, that's it's corn syrup. They put it in everything. And I was like, okay, well, it's kind of weird that you just stopped the film to make a message about corn syrup and how yeah. it's in every single product out there. All right, fine. But then when you see it, it's like, no, that played a role in this. There was a reason why they stopped to mention that, because it's like, yes, corn syrup is in almost everything that you eat. It would be real easy to put some kind of a weird little poison in every single thing that you eat if you control the corn syrup industry. It's like, holy freaking cow! That was brilliant of them. I thought that was so darn good. It did raise one question, though, of, like, why is Professor X still alive? Uh, simply because I was like, well, Wolverine's got the healing factor. But I love that even then, like, you can tell that the healing factor is slowly fading away. So it's clearly taking effect on him. Like, I thought it was like because like they grew their own vegetables in that I guess. Area. Like I could, yeah. That's the thing. I do have problems with this film. But almost every problem that I had, later in the film, they would give me something that makes me go, oh, we'll just erase that off the problem list. Okay, cool. Like, 
Uh, I had a question of like, why does Caliban, Caliban was some weird guy out in who knows where in Age of Apocalypse. How on earth did he get to a point, and he was like a scummy sleazebag, how did he get to the point where he's working with Wolverine to help save Charles Xavier out here? How did he get to that point? And then there's like one line that they give in there where he's just like, yeah, we hear that you used to work with us to help us hunt down mutants. I read about you when I was a kid. What changed you? What changed And you never hear what changed him, but you can like, Fill in the blanks in your head. Mm -hmm. They give you enough that you're like, I can write the story of how he got to that point. You know, maybe he saw too much. Maybe he just one day woke up and realized I'm killing my own kind. Maybe he realized I'm one of the last five mutants on Earth. Maybe he discovered what they were doing with these kids. So it's like, it doesn't matter what changed him. You now realize something changed. And it's like, okay, done. Or it's like, I had a problem with the fact that um, Laura X23, she doesn't talk at all for the first two thirds of this film. She's just mean mugging the whole time. And it is a huge, like, this is something that rarely ever comes up, but whenever I do see the trope of, like, the child soldier doesn't know how to talk, it bugs me. It bugs me so much because to me it just doesn't make sense. Because, like, if you wanted to raise someone to be, like, a perfect soldier, wouldn't you teach them to talk? Because they would need to be able to convey messages, they would need, be, need to be able to, like, go on spy missions, they would need to be able to use language for so many purposes. It's always bugged me, that idea. But then it gets to that point in which you see their perfect weapon, and it is a flat-out weapon. It is just a gun that they fire, and I'm like, oh, okay, like, you kind of had to explain yeah, it to me afterwards. Yeah, it's like they uh, made another uh, Wolverine clone. Yeah. It's like, obviously an older one. It pretty much looks exactly like it Logan. It looks like, it looks like... Very much like Logan. <laughs> it looks like 30-year-old Wolverine. Yeah. So it looks like Hugh Jackman at the top of his game. Yeah. And it's like... He did not talk, but they were giving him commands like he was a dog, a literal, like, military dog. He, like, they were just, like, they would literally sick him out, and they would just say, get him, get him, get him, and you just see him yeah. go after these people and just kill them without any Any, hesitation. like, sense of consciousness yeah, or anything. Yeah, exactly. Like, so. And when you kind of explained to me like that, I was like, okay, so they didn't want these kids to be soldiers. They wanted them to be guns. Mm -hmm. They wanted them yes. to just be point and shoot. That was it. And, like... Okay, I get that now. All right, I understand. Plus, you know, he has all these soldiers around at all times. And, mm -hmm. like, okay, if you need people to convey messages, you got those guys. All right, sure. Scratch that off the problems list. All right, fine. Makes total sense to me now. Uh, and also, I will say, when Laura finally does talk, I was, like, again, full spoilers, she only speaks Spanish. Like which makes total sense because they were raised in Mexico. Yeah. And the only people who actually did talk to them were these uh, Mexican nurses that were working at this corporation. So it's like, that makes absolute sense that she would only speak Spanish. It's like she spoke some English, but not really. Yeah, some. She was definitely more fluent in, Mex in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, so it was like, wow, the surprise of that, but the fact that it makes absolute total <laughs> sense, and I should have realized this long ago. Yeah, the build up to that, it absolutely works. So having her not talk about the whole thing, yeah. Totally surprising. And after that, she talks non-stop throughout this, and it all works so much because you can tell she had been holding this in because she did not want to talk to Wolverine. Mm -hmm. She wanted to talk just to Charles, and she was doing that telepathically. She had no reason to talk. She didn't want to talk to the big scary Wolverine dude. <laughs> she was like, I don't know, you fuck you. You're just some guy who my mom said would save me, and you don't want to save me. You're a washed up old fuck. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, I understood that, but then when Charles dies, uh, which, wow, that was a great yes. scene. Uh, when Charles dies, it was like, I have no... I have to talk to you, and you're about to die yourself. I don't want to, like, waste this. And I was like, yeah, she is his daughter. Because, like, there's that great moment in which he says, listen, it's for the best that I'm leaving. When I care about people, they die. And she goes, well, then I guess I'll be fine. And it was like, he doesn't want to bond with people. She doesn't want to bond with people. It's like, man, this really was, like, you nailed it in that. Uh... So yeah, like literally every single like problem I had, eventually there was something in this film that makes me just go, it's not a problem anymore. The only real problem that I still have at the end is that Laura and Wolverine don't really start to bond until like the third act, until like two thirds of the way through this film. I would have liked like, and it's solid progression after that point, and there's a good reason for them to start at that point. I would have dug like one scene like around the middle of this film where you see them start bonding. Like there's a moment when they go to a casino in Las Vegas and I was looking everywhere for arcade references. Like I was looking for <laughs> Easter eggs where it's like they're in Las Vegas, they're in places where people play big games of sin, have the guy who just builds giant death traps as video games 
in here somewhere. Have it be like arcades, casino, something like, like that. Like have Stanley like at the slots or something for a cameo. There actually, there was an old X Men cover uh, in which all the X Men were basically being put in a carnival freak show, and Stanley was on the cover as the Barker, like points. Like, <laughs> when you say that, it's like that would have been a great cameo for him. Uh, or like I figured, like I kept picturing like the Stanley cameo would be like when they finally do get to Eden. Like, I kept thinking, they're going to finally get to Eden, which Wolverine is looking through these X-Men comics, and he finds that the exact coordinates for the place where they say it's going to be this haven, the safe haven for mutants, it came from the X-Men comics. This X-Men comic they found, the X-Men are going to a place called Eden, and it's at these coordinates, and it's like, it's not real. This is all crap. None of this is actually real. I kept picturing at the end of this film they were going to find Eden and Stan Lee was going to be the guy running it and he was like, yeah, I just saw too much and I thought there needed to be a safe place for them. That's why I wrote those comics so that there could be a safe place. And I was like, that would be an amazing Stan Lee cameo. And even though it wouldn't have been set up at all in the story, I think people would have let that go because they would understand it's a weak and nod to Stan Lee creating these characters. All right, I get you. Stan Lee has no cameo. No. Here. He's not here at all. No. Unless he was like way in the back in one shot. Yeah. And didn't see it. Um... But and I'm glad that they did do that. Yeah. What they did was even better. Mm -hmm. uh, but who? There's so many other things that's like it's hard for me to peg down like where to talk. Um, let's also go with something that I was nervous that they were going to do because I actually enjoyed the Wolverine, the last Wolverine film. Uh, it wasn't great, but I thought it was pretty decent up until the final act. Yeah, like. It was like, okay, this is a personal story about him. It's what does he do when he's dying? Does he want to die? All this stuff back and forth. Like, okay, they're trying to say a lot. All right, I'm, I'm pretty cool with this. You know, it could be a little bit better, but you're not doing bad. And then at the end, it's like, well, we have to have him fight something. <laughs> so they just bring out a giant kaiju, like, mecha silver samurai. I was like, this doesn't match the rest of this film at all, and it's freaking stupid. Like, if you want to have the Silver Samurai, he literally fights a dude in a samurai uniform. I was like, have that suit made of silver, have some legend about this Silver Samurai that the family keeps talking about, and then at the end, the dude suits up and he fights Wolverine, and it's like, that's fine, that's your Silver Samurai. Don't have the giant mecha <laughs> show up. And there's a moment in which they're talking about these kids, and these kids are being raised as weapons, and then they decide the kids can't be controlled. You, they have to create a weapon, and you, sit, and you hear her say, they created something even worse. And you see like a brief x-ray of like giant claws. I thought it was going to be Predator X. In the comics there is this creature called Predator X. It was basically some genetically created just big monster, big on all fours, giant mouth. They coat its skin in adamantium. They feed it only mutants and then they starve it so that when they let them out, they just hunt mutants nonstop and just kill them wherever they find them. I thought that's what it was going to be. I was like, that'd be a cool way to introduce Predator X into your film universe. But don't do that. This is a personal story about this guy. If he, at the end, has to fight a giant monster, it's going to be stupid. The fact that the monster that they created is just a younger version of Wolverine, a straight-up clone of him, that's the perfect villain to fight in this. Like, either that or just Sabretooth. Like, yeah. those would have been the two options. And I'm cool with this one because, like, throughout his entire life, his greatest enemy has been himself. It's every chance that he had to, like, get a family and stuff. It's like, no, can't lose anyone else. And he just, like, gets angry at himself and then walks off into the sunset. It's like, man, your greatest enemy is yourself. And it's been your own personal rage. It's been that berserker rage that he is known for. This is him at the peak of his physical power, and it's nothing but berserker rage. It's all the humanity out of him, and it's just that berserker rage in there. And I'm like, that's the perfect villain for him to fight, because that's what he has been fighting his whole life. It's the Berserker Rage. This is the embodiment of Berserker Rage. And like, God, that was brilliant. Like, I was blown away by that. And the fact that, like, he was able to sneak up on Charles Xavier and, like, in, spoilers again for old man Logan in the comic, but in the comic, Wolverine killed all the X-Men because he was tricked by Mysterio into thinking that the mansion was being attacked by, like, a legion of supervillains. And so he just went nuts and, like, he started killing all these supervillains. And then at the end, like, the fog fades away, the illusion goes away, and it's real. He just killed all the other X-Men himself. There's a moment in here in which Charles... They keep mentioning something that happened a year ago. Something that happened a year ago, and 
Charles Xavier is, has this moment where she's like, I couldn't remember until now, but I, I killed people before, I hurt people, and like he's crying about it, and made me go, did he like kill bad people who were coming to stop him? Did he just kill innocent people who happened to be around him when he had a seizure? Or did he have a seizure at the school and he killed all the remaining mutants? Like, was he the one that ended up taking out the rest of the X-Men? Uh, I love that they don't tell you because like you're a lot, it gives you, you get the emotional impact no matter what, but like it does leave you going, oh man, fill in the blanks. Like it does make you want to know like the backstory on all of this. Like it gives you enough information to know that something has yeah. happened, but not enough, not enough for it to be like specific. Exactly. It's not enough to bog you down with details. Yeah. It's enough to give you the emotional impact. Right. That this movie walks that fine line this entire time. Mm -hmm. And I'll admit there were times where me just being like a war junkie, it was kind of a problem simply because the X-Men fil films have always had this problem that they don't know what the fudge they want to be because, like, I was so glad in Deadpool when they say, we're taking you to see the Professor A, and he's like, uh, Stuart or uh, whatever the other kid's name was, I can't keep up with these conflicting timelines. I was like, <laughs> yeah, because there was a moment in here in which uh, Charles Xavier goes, the Statue of Liberty, and Logan's like, the Statue of Liberty was a long time ago, and that's a reference back to the very first film where they fought yeah. the Statue of Liberty, and, but it was at that moment, I was like, that's great. That does show, like, all this stuff still happened. This is a great bookend to all that. But then it was kind of after that that I started thinking. It's like, wait a minute, what the heck did happen? Because if all this stuff previous to this is still kind of canon, why does Wolverine still have metal claws? Because he had bone claws at the end of the Wolverine, which canonically is the last film that came in this timeline. But then they went back and they changed that. But then the first X-Men movie still happened, I guess. But then what X-Men movie after that still happened? Like, I know that's stupid of me to go into this because that's not the point of this film. But I couldn't help it. At one point, that was, like, a problem for me. I was like, oh, yeah, the X-Men films don't match up at all. None of this actually, like, adds up. Like, yeah, it kind of, it did kind of give me that problem at one point. I felt like when uh, Wolverine went back in time, he still kept his memory, so... That's, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, what does he know? Because when you get to the end of Days of Future Past, mm -hmm. he still remembers everything. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so, so yeah, it's like... And then... Let, then all I'm uh, trying to say, folks, is don't think about that. But then, like, Charles read his mind. is like, oh, crap, that all did happen, Yeah, didn't Charles it, so. reads his mind and goes, oh, well, let me fill you in, my friend. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, all I'm trying to say is, don't, don't. <laughs> if you start going down that rabbit hole, you ain't coming out. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so the villain was the perfect villain to have at the end of this. In fact, the guy who runs this corporation is the son of the guy who put the adamantium in him in the first place, which is what's killing him now. I love that they actually brought up the fact that now that his healing factor is going away, he has metal in his bloodstream. It is killing him. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought that was great. Uh, and, like I said, after they start bonding, it really did start, like, they only have, like, maybe 30 minutes to form a connection in here. Man, they use that 30 minutes. <laughs> that 30 minutes was great. Uh, and I love, like, seeing all the little kids up there and the fact that they all had, like, this little refugee camp. Like, that was so good, too. Uh, yeah, it's like, everyone, everyone's, like... Well, the way they built up Eden, you think it was like this paradise. Yeah, I thought it was going to be like... Uh, like this like safe haven, like this giant, beautiful... This giant, like side, all farmlands, all beautiful... Well, like this advanced uh, like buildings yeah. and technology. And it was there's like, a place in... Um, uh, uh, there's a place in the comics where the Weapon X facility eventually became... I forget exactly what it's called, but it's basically just a giant dome, and in there it's just, con just giant sci-fi buildings and something like... I thought that's what it was going to be, like an old Weapon X facility that they turned into paradise or something. No! It's a, like a crappy shed where these kids are all just making do, mm -hmm. and they mention, like, yeah, over the border there's, in the Canada, there's some safe place, but it's like, holy cow, like, and that was brilliant, that, like, the kid knew the whole time, like, Wolverine was like, this is crap, this is made up by comic books, it doesn't exist. It's great that they eventually realized, yeah, we know that, you idiot, but we were using this as our secret code of where to all meet up. And like, that's so freaking smart. God, <laughs> that is good writing. Okay. Oh, okay. And another thing that I got to point out that some people are saying, but 
Yeah, one you have problem with this, because you guys know me if you've watched these, you know that one of the things I complain about the most is Deus Ex Machina, when the answer to a problem just magically appears at the end of the film. And at the end of the film, Wolverine is beating down these dying, and he brings out this green goop stuff and injects himself with it and accelerates his healing factor so he's able to keep fighting. I know some people out there are going to say, well, wasn't that a Deus Ex Machina? No, it freaking wasn't, no. because earlier in this film, they see that it's the stuff that they give to the Wolverine clone that they create so that he can heal back quicker. And it would make absolute sense they would have something like that. It makes total sense that these guys would have that to give to this guy so that he can keep fighting. And it would make sense that these kids would have some of that too because they probably got fed it too so that they could keep fighting nonstop. And so, yeah, it makes total sense that would be in there. And it's not like it's a magic thing that just instantly solves everything. No. There's a downside, too, because they're like, yeah, the moment it starts to wear off, you get hit hard. So, yeah, it's not an instant, it's not Popeye eating his spinach, no. where it's like, now I'm going to go in and save the day. It's and like, specific... this is your last thing. This is the last thing that you can do to go on your one last job. And they specifically say, don't take it all at once. And he goes, he, took, he takes it all at once. Because he's like, I gotta save those kids. Yes. And I'm like, God, it's so freaking good. Um... I should get into what made me ball, though. <laughs> what made me cry so hard. And it's at the end of this film when Wolverine dies. And also, I just gotta say, out of all the X-Men films, the one X-Men film I've still not seen is Wolverine Origins because everybody told me that was garbage. And when everybody tells you something is garbage, go ahead and trust them that's <laughs> garbage. Like, I was like, so many people have told me this is crap, I ain't even gonna bother with it. However, I do know what happens in that film. I've watched enough videos and reviews about it, and I know that in that, they have a adamantium bullet that they are going to use to kill Wolverine. They're saying it's the only thing that can actually pierce like his adamantium skeleton. The fact that they bring that up, and they go, yeah, someone gave it to me a long time ago, and I'm just thinking of blowing my brains out with it. And they use that to kill the evil Wolverine clone. I was like, that was so, they took something from the worst X-Men <laughs> film and used it to redeem this film. <laughs> That's amazing to me. I was blown away by that. Uh, but the thing that made me cry is that, like, after Wolverine dies, and it is brutal, mm -hmm. uh, let's just talk about the violence real quick. Yeah. And this thing is like, I've been saying for the longest time, if you're going to make a true Wolverine film, it has to be rated R because the dude's superpower is he stabs people and gets blown away and regenerates in gruesome details. And there was a moment in which you see like the scratches on him mm -hmm. and they're not healing back quite right. It, ugh. Yeah, you oh. gagged at that part. I literally <laughs> gagged at it. Uh, so yeah, this film, when it opens up and he just slices a dude's arm off, I was like, that's Wolverine. Mm -hmm. Everybody out there is like, well, that's not the Wolverine. I know, read some Wolverine comics. <laughs> He will slice people, and there's just a big, like, gusher of blood when he scratches across them. Like, that's stuff that's been in the comics for years. Yeah, it's about time that we saw that in the film. And I get why you can't do that in the PG-13 films. The X-Men films should be for everyone. But if you're going to make an accurate Wolverine film, he's going to have to slice a dude's arm off at some point. He's like, let X-Men be PG, PG-13, let Wolverine and be Logan R. be R. Yeah, exactly. And Deadpool. Like, I'm yes. so glad. <laughs> I have so many problems with the X-Men franchise over the, at Fox. I think they screw up a lot of stuff. But when they get it right, they get it right. <laughs> and with Deadpool and Wolverine, I think they finally started to realize, we don't know what they're doing, but we can find people who do, and if we just back the fudge up and let them do what they want to do, <laughs> we can get a good movie. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't, I'm not that bothered by the mixed up continuity in here from the previous films, because like, Gosh darn it, all went up to a really great film. As long as you don't think about it, this film was amazing, so I ain't gonna think about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the thing that made me just ball is when Wolverine dies, uh, her saying daddy and all that, that was really touching to me. But then they bury him, uh, and then you see all these little kids standing around, and one of the kids is holding a Wolverine doll. And that's the moment that it really hit me. <laughs> like, I kept thinking, like, okay, they snuck a Wolverine comic. They snuck an X-Men comic to these kids in there, and that's how they, these kids knew the location of the album. I was like, okay. But when I saw the kid with the Wolverine doll, like I didn't want to stop to question where he get that, because I instantly knew these nurses at this facility, they had been bringing them like X-Men toys, X-Men comics, and they were telling them, they're mutants just like you, and they're heroes, and they're going to come and save you. And like just thinking about this kid had a Wolverine doll that he probably held every single night, and he thought, this guy is going to come and save us. This guy is going to come and save us. 
And the last thing this guy did after losing himself, after falling so far into despair and just falling so far down, the last thing he does with his crappy life is he saves that kid. And I was like, I'm literally getting choked up thinking about that again right now. Like, that really is to me just like, that is what a superhero is. This film is like a hard R, really graphic, really dark and edgy, and yet it is a superhero film. It does not lose that. It does not lose what makes this special. Mm -hmm. It's like, just thinking about those kids every single night going, they're coming to save us, they're coming to save us. That it gets to that point in which there's no hope left. Wolverine comes out like, <laughs> that's the last thing he did is he was a hero to the people that needed him to be a hero. That is amazing to me. And then when she pulled the cross out, I stopped for a second because I was like, please tell me she's not going to start digging him up and his healing factor kicked in and he's alive now. <laughs> Fuck you if you do that. This film will drop so hard for me if you do that. And then she just turns the cross sideways and makes an X and I was like, he died in X-Men. The last X-Men died in X-Men. That is how he goes out. And here's the thing. I hate saying this. I don't want any more X-Men films. Because mm -hmm. having the guy who started this whole franchise off, who carried this franchise for so long, having him die as the last X-Men in what, to me, hands down, is the best X-Men film, that's the way to end it. Yeah. From here on out, if you want to make an X-Factor movie where it's just... Jamie Madrox leading his detective agency in Brooklyn? Fine. If you want to make X-Force, like the government task force just going out there on their hardcore mission with Cable to stop the big threats? Fine. If you want, which by the way, I realize that X-Factor was the government one and X-Force was not connected, but you know what I'm saying. This is my pitch for Fox right now. Uh, and if you want to keep making Deadpool movies, keep making all the Deadpool movies you want. The X-Men are done now. Don't go back to them. <laughs> I don't care if they're like, but we had this Mr. Sinister storyline. Go fuck your Mr. Sinister storyline. This was the ending to this. Well, we were going to also make a Laura Kinney X-23 movie. No, leave that question up to us. Leave it up to us whether or not she actually finds paradise because we know the important part of this story is that they're free now. The corporation that was after them, gone. It, they are free. That's their ending. Freedom. They got it. If you come in here and go, but they weren't actually free, there's one more fight. Go fuck yourself. I don't want to see her fighting the juggernaut or whatever. It's not important now. What's important is they are free. Anything else you want to say? Uh, I'm still emotionally overwhelmed by this. I still need some a little bit more time to gather my thoughts. But uh, uh, I guess the thing is, hmm, I will say this. I first... <laughs> it is a lot to take in, guys. I'm sorry, like... I seriously am trying to go, like, where does this rank on my favorite comic book films of all time? It's like, it might be number one, but I realize I'm still just so in the moment right now. I gotta, like, I gotta wait, like, a week to figure out where I want to place this. Because, like, right now, it might, it's probably number one because I'm just still so overwhelmed. But, like, I also remember how I was when I got out of the first Avengers film, which I was like, that is absolutely number one. So I'm, like, trying to, like, weigh in my head, like, okay... Well, here's how I feel about Avengers now, after I've had time to think about some, how am I going to feel about Wolverine in a week? But that's why we do the post geek out reactions. Right. This is our immediate thoughts. Not our immediate immediate, because I would be crying like crazy. Yeah. I almost started there when I talked about the kid with the doll again. <laughs> uh, it's like, the, the part that got to me was, like, with the failing and everything. It's like, I knew that they were going to get caught up in this, and that they were eventually gonna get screwed over. I didn't know how bad they were gonna get screwed over. Yeah, god damn. Yeah, but it's like, at the same time, it's like... Like, when they first popped up, I was like, I know what happens when Wolverine gets close to people, I know these guys are gonna die, but then they made me think, Oh, no! No, they're not! They're yeah, not so they fine. actually like, gave us time to get to know these people. And, and also, you see Wolverine go out there with him to the water thing, and he, like, scares the guys off yeah. who, are, who are, like, controlling their water supply. So it's like, that's what this is, because there's a moment when they're in the hotel room, and they're watching Shane on TV. Yes. And it's such a brilliant moment, because that's the moment when Wolverine comes in with the comic books and goes, this didn't happen, this is bullshit, but then you also have Patrick Stewart there talking about Shane, and he's like, this was such an emotional movie, this is so important to me when I was your age. For, spoiler for anybody who has never seen Shane, Shane is one of my favorite westerns of all time. Uh, but in Shane, it's about this guy, he is kind of just this cowboy who just goes from place to place, just wandering around the desert. He finds this family that is being um, 
kind of uh, bullied and kind of controlled by all these outlaws there in town. And Shane just comes in, clears up all the outlaws, and then at the end of the film, he's like, it's time for me to head on out. And this little kid is like, why? Why do you have to go, Shane? Why can't you stay here, Shane? He's like, I'm sorry, but it's just how I am. I can't change. I gotta go on out there. And just goes out, and spoiler for the end of Shane, like, at the end of it, he's riding off on the horse, and this kid is screaming, Shane, come back, Shane, Shane, come back. And Shane never responds to him. So it's always been that question of, did he die? Did he, like, get injured in the gunfight? And, like, it's just now catching up to him. He's, like, just basically riding there dead on the horse. Or is he just not paying attention to the kid? Like, he's just trying to cut off connections with the kid. And, which, the moment that I saw they were playing Shane, I was like, Wolverine dies in this. Wolverine absolutely dies. You're not going to play Shane, the film <laughs> where the guy maybe or maybe did not die, and not have Wolverine die in this. Or at least question whether or not he'll die. You know, if he rides off into the sunset, and they're like, Oh, is he, is he not coming back? Okay, and it's like, oh, I think he finally died. Uh, so I was like, that's going to be one of the two options. He either dies or we think he might die. Um, but then when they're, like I said, it's about this guy who just roams around helping this random family. And it's a family of a dad, a, a dad, a mom, and a son. They meet a family that's a dad, a mom, and a son. And he scares off the outlaw guys who are controlling his water supply. And I was like... That's why they showed, okay, so this family isn't going to die. They were here just to go, he's a modern day Shane. So they're not going to die. But when they die, holy cow. Yeah. That's amazing to me that, like, it was like, oh, you think they're going to die? Now you don't think they're going to die. Now they die. It's like, God, this was so well done. And it's like, I felt like it was important for uh, Laura, too, because, like, she pretty much, like, spent her entire life, like, in a facility trained to mm. fight. So she has not had much experience with humanity. Yeah, when she, that's the first time we see her smile yeah. all throughout this, is there at the family table. She's just mean mugging for the first, like, two thirds of this film. But that's the first time that we actually see her, like, smile. And also she's, like, she, you know, she would take things that she wants or needs and, like, doesn't, like, give a crap about it. Oh, but, yeah. you know, then when she sees, you know, when she sees Charles help them out with their horses and everything, and that how they were so nice, and they... But also just how they were sharing at the dinner Yeah, table. exactly. Just sharing and just, like, being a good... A family. Yes, decent, good people and a nice family. She realizes, oh, these are the people we're fighting for. Yeah, like, she realizes this is what a family is. Like, I yes. think that's the moment she starts yeah. to, like, realize, like, oh, so that's what it means to have a dad. That's yeah. What means, yeah, okay. Uh, man, this film just did so many things right. And I just, I'm not trying to start any shit here. <laughs> I'm not, but I just have to say this. When I saw Civil War, I looked back at Batman vs. Superman, which I already did not like, and I just went, that movie is now absolute shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, but go fuck that film. This movie made me look at all of Warner Brothers, and they're, we're going to be hard hitting. Oh, we're going to have R-rated animated films. Yeah, you didn't see that coming. Oh, we have an R-rated cut of Batman vs. Superman. Oh, and it made me look at those and go, you guys don't know what you're doing. You are the lame geeky kid trying to dance and impress people with his moves, and everybody's looking at him like, Who the f who's this kid over here? Like, this is the kid... Uh, this Warner Bros. is the kid who thinks that just because he can break up a cardboard box and put it on the ground, that means that he can break dance. No, you fucking can't, all right? This is break dancing, all right? That's the weirdest review that you will ever hear of Logan. Okay. But seriously, that's what this is. It's like, this is an R-rated movie done right. It earned the R rating. Yeah, it's like, none of the, like, to me, they overused fuck a little bit in the first 30 yeah, minutes, but, but that was about it. After that, every time they use it, it's like, yeah, that's the appropriate word to use here. Every time that you see blood, it's like, that's because this is a Wolverine story. Mm -hmm. Every time that you see him, like, just really getting down, like, you see the horrible stuff happening, it's because that's the kind of story that this is. When you see Laura just go ape and start slashing mm -hmm. into people, it's like, because she was raised to be a weapon, that's what a weapon does, and she moves like a weapon. It's like, yeah, this film uses the R rating very appropriately. This yeah. is not like, oh, we're going to have a tiny spatter of blood here, and we're going to have some random guy say fuck. Yeah, remember, I saw the Batman vs Superman extended cut. That did not need to be rated <laughs> R. You could digitally take out that tiny blood splatter there, and that could be the one fuck that you get in a PG-13 movie, and we'll have been fine. It's like, 
God, that was such a lame attempt to be an R rating. And the same thing goes for all their animated films. Yeah. Which are like, oh, it's the R rated cut of, it's like, Justice League Dark. I really like that animated film. It didn't need to be R rated. Warner Brothers is going on their hands and knees to the ratings board going, please, we have to look cool. Don't give yourself an R rating unless you absolutely earn it. This film earned it. And don't come in here and go, we're going to be hard and edgy. And you think the definition of hard and edgy is standing there staring off into the distance, speaking in monotone. That doesn't make it adult. That doesn't make it mature. That doesn't make it intellectual. This film is loaded with emotions. This film is loaded with people emoting. This is filled with people feeling things. It is an adult film. Yes. God damn, fuck you, Warner <laughs> Brothers. Sorry, God, that, I just, <laughs> Suicide Squad became even worse for me after watching this thing. <laughs> so, did, so did the killing joke, so did Batman vs. Superman all over again. It's like, Warner Brothers, if you want to get mature with your films, take some goddamn notes, all right? <laughs> God. Like, yeah, seriously, like, Logan puts, like, all those movies to shame. Yeah. God, I'm sorry. It's like the, oh, our Batman is going to be old and washed up and he's seen too much. Uh, no, Logan's seen too much. Your Batman's kind of grumpy and speaks with an auto-tune. That's it. God. <laughs> that was the one thing for Batman vs. Superman I kind of liked. It's like, yeah, Ben Affleck is Batman. It's pretty good. This made me now hate that. It's like, I now don't like anything about that film. <laughs> God damn it. All right. I'm going to get so many downvotes on here because there's people who are going to be watching this just like, I wasn't expecting to just get assaulted on your Batman vs. Superman crap. I was like, all right, holy cow. Yeah, this was such an emotional film. <laughs> and I loved it so much. Yeah. It might be my favorite superhero film of all time. It's definitely in the top five. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably definitely in the top three. Uh, so, yeah. Let us know in the comments down below what you guys thought of this. I'm sure that after we stop recording, I'm going to think of so many other things I want to say. <laughs> but I'll try and put it all into the review yeah. itself. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. Come back next time. Bye. Bye.